So Dijkstra's algorithm can be applied to any problem where we have a graph of nodes connected by edges. The edges have associated costs or weights which are non-negative and we want to find a minimum cost path from a start node to a goal node. And so although we imagine this to be a representation of a road network where the costs associated with the edges are distances or travel time, it is a general algorithm that can be applied to any problem which can be expressed as a problem which needs to find a minimum path in a graph. Now we are now interested in the navigation in empty spaces. So if this is your start and this is your goal, then the optimum path would of course be the direct connection of start to goal with one straight line segment. However, if there is an obstacle, like another car, you would have to go around this obstacle and finding that path in a continuous space of all possible paths from start to go may be pretty complicated. However, think of the following. If you make a raster of cells where navigation is only allowed between the centers of the cells, then this will implicitly define a graph. And then we may use the algorithm of Dijkstra to find a route on this graph. And if there is an obstacle, we will just disallow those graph nodes, which will then lead to a different route. And I just said that we subdivide the world into a number of raster cells, and by only allowing movement between the centers of the cells, we define a graph. I did not mention that we have an option with regard to what edges we actually allow. So if we only allow the four neighbors for each cell, meaning Every node is connected by four edges to neighboring nodes, and these edges all have the cost 1. Then the following cost structure results on a grid. Say again we want to go from start to go. So start is the node with zero cost. Now since this is connected to its four neighbors, we can reach those neighbors by cost 1. Now going on in our Dijkstra algorithm, we will pick a node with cost 1 next and check which neighbors can be reached. These will be those three plus S, but this has been visited already. Then we pick this node, it will add those elements and so on. Then we pick a node with cost two and it will add nodes with cost three. And now you can see this pattern of increasing node cost traveling along a front line. So now if you connect all the nodes with cost five, you will see this front line. So when you use a four neighborhood, then the expansion of the cost front starting from S will look like this. Now alternatively, you may also use an eight neighborhood, which includes the four neighbors we had previously, each with cost one, plus the diagonal neighbors, which now have distance square root of two, so approximately 1.4. So if we apply this, to our search on the grid, we will get 1 for the horizontal and vertical neighbors of S and 1.4 for the diagonal neighbors. Then we will pick a node with minimum cost, which is for example this one here. We will get a cost of 2 here and a cost of 2.4 going this diagonal here and here. The same will happen here and here and of course here. Now the next element with minimum cost is actually this 1.4 here, which can go diagonal for a cost of 2.8. The next minimum element is 2, for which we'll get those neighbors, 2.4, for which we'll get this neighbor, and 2.8, for which we'll get this neighbor. Then 3 is the minimum cost node. We will get 4, 4.4, and I will now fill in all the remaining ones. And as you see, the node G, which has previously been reached with a cost of 5, is now reached with a more realistic cost of 4.4, whereas its Euclidean distance is actually 4 to the right, 1 up, so this distance is the square root of 4 squared plus 1 squared, which is approximately 4.1. So you see the distance which we obtained by using the 8 neighborhood, 4.4, is still not the correct Euclidean distance, but it is better than the distance we obtained 
using the for neighborhood. And now if you try to draw the front line, you will see, say, for a constant cost of 4, you can go here. You also can get almost there. And of course, you can go here. And so you see, the front line will now have this shape. So we'll get an octagon. So if we use the 8 neighborhood, our search space will have a shape like that when it expands into free space. So now let's try to program this. Now before we start programming, I will show you the outcome. So you will implement the Dijkstra algorithm and your implementation will be integrated into a simple graphical user interface which I have provided for you. So this works as follows. Clicking your left mouse button and dragging it will allow you to define obstacles. Whereas clicking the right or middle mouse button will allow you to delete the obstacles again and clicking clear will delete all obstacles altogether. Now when you press shift while clicking the left mouse button, this will allow you to set the start point and pressing shift, clicking the middle or right mouse button will allow you to define the end point. And as soon as both points are defined, the routing algorithm will start to run and it will visualize the set of visited nodes. So what you can see here is exactly the octagon which we have seen on the slide before and which results from a graph defined by the 8 neighborhood structure. So if you start to define obstacles here, those will disallow the search in this area. But of course, the search will go around those obstacles. And especially if you block the path from start to goal, the search will go around this blockage which comes at an extra cost. And so you will see that the overall search space expands when the direct path to the goal is blocked. You will also realize that in this present implementation, the algorithm is pretty slow. So if you place start and goal at a large distance, you will have to wait for a long time and we will fix that later. So here we go. This is the path planning 01 a file and this will be the first programming task. So now let me quickly go through this program. First of all, make sure that you have installed all the additional libraries needed for this assignment because otherwise you will get import errors and the graphical user interface will not show up properly. Then let's have a look at the first line here. This is the world extents. So this means that all our path planning experiments will take place on a 200 times 150 grid. And if you like, you can set this to different numbers. If you make it larger, then also the display area will get larger. But in general, making it larger will just make it slower and will probably not give you extra insights. So this is our map of obstacles. We have the following convention. If there is an obstacle, meaning a blocked raster cell in our environment, we will put in the value 255 and if it's free space, we will put in a zero. So I could have also chosen one here, but instead I use the maximum value of an unsigned 8-bit integer for reasons that will become clear later on. We will also have a second array with all the visited cells, which will be set later. And this second array will show up in the graphical user interface as this green area, which you saw earlier, where green means the pixel has been visited and black means it has not been visited yet. After running the algorithm, we will also get the optimal path from start to goal, but we didn't talk about this yet, so we will postpone discussion until later. Here are a few functions which handle the graphical user interface, so they are not important. If you're interested in what's going on, then have a look, but otherwise don't be worried about them. The main thing that happens here is that there's an update callback function which finally calls your implementation of the Dijkstra algorithm saying it wants to go from start to go and it gets this obstacle map. Now let's go down to the main part of the algorithm. And first of all, here is some movements defined. So this entry means go plus one in x direction and go zero in y direction. And this move is 
associated a cost of 1. So this goes to the right and costs 1. This goes 0 in x and 1 in y, so this goes up and also costs 1. This goes left and this goes down. And those four possible movements here together, they make up the four neighbors. And here is the remaining four elements for the diagonal neighbors. So this means go one right, one up, and the cost is s2, and s2 here is said to be the square root of 2. So this is approximately 1.4. This means go left and up at cost 1.4 and so on. And if you have fun playing with those movements, you may comment out this line, for example, and then the algorithm will be constrained to four neighbors and you will get different shape of the search space exploration as you have seen earlier when we executed the algorithm by hand. So now here is the part you'll have to implement. And for your convenience, there is already the main elements of the algorithm. So the main structure is given. And you'll have to implement the parts where there is a change. So whenever it says change, 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 you'll have to implement those parts. And so watch out for those comments. Those comments are based on the algorithm which was given earlier and should help you to understand the overall structure of the algorithm. So let's go through this from top to bottom. So first of all, front is just a start node. Now I can't assign directly the start node because front should be a collection of elements, a set. Well, in this case, we use a list. So and we put into this list one single element, which is a tuple, which contains the cost, which is zero for the start node, and the start itself. So in this case, start consists of two elements, namely x and y. So in the second part, the visited array is initialized. So this calls the numpy function zero. So it's initialized to all zeros. And I need to know the rows and columns of this matrix and I'll obtain them in the previous line by getting the number of rows and columns of the obstacles array. So I use the dimensions of the obstacles array to define the visited array and the visited array is all zeros. For reasons that become obvious later I use a data type of float whereas currently it would be sufficient to use some integer because we just want to mark the visited cells so we only need zero and one or we could use a boolean array and mark it with true and false. So here comes the main loop while our front is not empty and we can write this in Python conveniently as while front. And first of all, we need to get the smallest item from front, which is this list. And after we found the smallest item, we'll have to remove it. So since front is a list, you'll have to look up which methods of list allow you to remove the element. Then we check if this has been visited already. And remember that the element we picked from front actually consists of a cost and a node or a cost and a position. So I just assign this element to the two variables cost, which is now a float, and the position, which is the xy position. Now first of all, after this is assigned, you will have to skip the rest of the loop if the visited array shows you that this position has been visited already, in which case its value will be larger than zero. Now the next thing is to do, if it has not been visited, you will have to mark it as being visited. So you set it, for example, to the value of one. Now here's a part which you can keep as is. After you checked all this, you mark this node, you just check if this position that you have reached is already the goal, in which case we break the loop. So we break this while loop and we are finished. And so we return all the visited nodes. But if not, then you will continue and first of all you will have to check all the neighbors. So you make a loop over all delta x, delta y and delta cost in the list of possible movements. Remember, the movements were up here and if it did not comment out anything, these are the eight possible movements which you will consider in the loop down here. So for each possible movement, you have to compute a new position in x and y and then you have to check that this new position is still within bounds of our world. So it is not allowed to get smaller than zero and it is not allowed to be 
larger or equal to the horizontal or vertical extents of our world. And so the extents, they are stored in extents 0 and in extents 1. And these are the extents we obtained actually up here. So these are the bounds of our array. And if the point is outside our world, then use a skip, which means in Python use the continue statement to skip the rest of this for loop. Now if it is inside, for convenience I put the new x and new y into a tuple, because we can use that down here. And then we have to check if visited is zero and our obstacles are not 255 at this new position. Then we will append the tuple to our list front. The tuple will be the cost. And the cost is the cost of our element that we have picked here from our list plus the delta cost. That is the cost of the edge connecting our pass position and our new new pass position. So we have to add up those two values and we have to enter this as the new cost for the neighbor node and the position of this new node. So this is the tuple that has to be appended to the front. So for example in the beginning when we get the smallest element this will be the start element, the cost will be zero, the position will be the start and this loop here will be over all the eight neighbors of the start element and if there is no obstacle it will actually add eight elements to the front list. So below here there's the main program and you don't have to be concerned about this. It sets some callback mechanism which allows you to control the graphical user interface. It sets an extra button which is the clear button which allows you to clear all obstacles and then it initializes and starts the graphical user interface. So now go ahead and program this version of the Dijkstra algorithm.